is the story of the original and the original. Oh, okay, so I was like, I didn't know that. Awesome. Did anyone not get the professional quality of life scale? Okay. So there's three pages to it. I didn't have time to save them. That's one. This could be a self-care assessment. Um, this is the professional quality of life scale, and then a self-care wheel. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you. And uh, just to make sure before you leave, make sure that you did sign in over here so you get credit. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this class goes until 9.30? Okay, not sure. Um, so the topic that we'll be talking about today is secondary traumatic stress and self-care. What is the cost of caring? And I'm going to do some, I guess you call it lecturing, or giving you some information. And we're also going to have some um, conversation. So your engagement and um, feedback is really appreciated during this presentation. So I wanted to start off with a quote from the Dalai Lama. Um, I thought that this was a really good quote because um, number one, I just wanna say, I have so much respect for all of you all. I think teaching is the hardest profession and I watched what you guys, how much you work, how hard you work and all of the effort you put into our students and um, I just really appreciate it. But I also know that it takes a lot out of you. You know, it's more than just talking. You put your heart into these students your, you know, your care, and it can be really challenging, especially um, with the population that we work with, because a huge percentage is at risk, and um, there's a lot of trauma that goes on. So hopefully today, you'll get some information about um, secondary traumatic stress, but also starting a conversation, and maybe even like a culture in our school of self-care, and um, supporting one another, and making sure that everyone's whole self is being taken care of. So um, just to start off with a little bit of information, um, I don't want to just talk, talk, talk. I will want your feedback, but a little, the first part will be me talking. So um, exposure. As caring professionals at Seneca, champions, um, you all hear lots of stories from students, I know, because I hear them too, um, and a lot of those stories are really difficult to hear. Um, and witness the pain that some of the kids that we work with go through. Um, and it's even true for some of the people we work with. It might be difficult because you care and you work these people, you know, 40, 30, 40 hours a week, and um, it's hard to shut that part of your, your heart off when, you know, you're being professional, but you also have this loving part of you, and that's why you went into the profession. And so um, also, you know, you and the students also can range from being a survivor, a witness, a responder, to truly traumatic events and horrific events. And so we know that that is going to affect you, not just here at school, but also in your personal life. <clears throat> um, we've talked about this a little bit in, uh, I think the presentation that Ms. Derensberg and I gave in the, earlier in the year. These are some symptoms of trauma in the classroom. If you could just take a second and look through these. Um, and I just have a couple questions. Is there anything on here that you feel like, is there is there anything that's not on here that you guys feel like you see and is missing? Or is there something that you have a question about how this goes on in your classroom or something that you're concerned about? How many of you all see these symptoms in your classroom? How many of you all see these on an everyday basis? Okay. There you go. It's pretty significant. Um, and so just to give a little information, because sometimes we're like, okay, so someone's been traumatized, 
but how do we know the level or the degree to which it has affected them? And so this is kind of how you can measure um, the degree of how that trauma has impacted them. So some things to consider would be the degree of the disturbance. So for example, some of our students um, have parents that are in and out of their lives. And then some have witnessed violence in their communities firsthand. You know, and so though there's kind of a different degree and each person and child is different to how you will uh, respond to having that trauma occur. What's traumatic to one person might not be traumatic to another person. Um, and so what other things to take into concern are the developmental stage of the child, where their brain is in terms of development. Um, is it a one-time event or is it an ongoing event? You know, if you live with a parent who has uh, substance abuse or addiction or mental illness, that's not just a one-time event. There's gonna be things that occur on a regular basis. Um, how is this in the context of the family and community that they live in? So, you know, a lot of students that I speak to, they say, I don't feel safe where I live. Or um, there was a shooting last night and I was scared. Um, and then, um, you know, is it normalized in their family? So like, just like when I said about substance abuse or uh, addiction or mental illness, that might have become the norm in their life. You know, they might not know anything differently. Um, and another protective factor has to do with what is the availability of other family members and community members to support them? You know, so um, for example, when someone has been assaulted, you know, sometimes the assault is traumatic in itself, but what can also <laughs> dictate how they uh, personify that or, t you know, change their inner thoughts would be, did someone believe them? Did someone come to protect them? Um, that, those factors play a big role in it as well. Um, and so impact on champions. So we know, you all know, of course, the tremendous amount of physical and mental energy that it takes to be a teacher and to be effective as a teacher. So, you know, some of the, one of the questions that I'm interested in um, is how do you achieve and maintain the levels of mental and physical energy that are required to sustain yourselves as champions and teachers in our school? It's a lot, you know, I see it, I only see it, I mean, I experience it on my end, but I know your all's roles is a little different than mine because you are constantly with a large group of students. Um, and I think that that is very challenging. And so it, we also know that it doesn't just affect you in the classroom. I know that for me, I take things home, you know, because of my care and concern for teachers and students. And so it can bleed into your personal life, your family, your relationships. Um, so basically it impacts you as a whole person. And just to kind of go over a little bit of information about different symptoms that can occur based on what you've been exposed to. So one um, classification of the effects of hearing um, or experiencing emotional duress or hearing firsthand traumas from someone else, especially someone that you care about, um, is called compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue can mimic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, I've, you, most of you have probably heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's really common. Um, people think of like combat veterans who you know, experienced violence in war and come back and um, they really suffer and they may act differently or um, be more reactive in situations where there's no perceived threat. And so some of those symptoms would be um, having nightmares, flashbacks, uh, triggers, things that trigger you to have flashbacks, avoiding situations that remind you of the event, event negative changes in your beliefs or feelings, and feeling keyed up or um, hyper arousal. And so if, not to mention our students who have been through these events, a lot of them may have post-traumatic stress disorder and you may see these symptoms in the classroom, but some of these symptoms you don't see. You know, so um, if you see a student that something happens and it's like all of a sudden they're just, you can tell they're different, you know, either they're really keyed up and they're angry or they totally shut down, you know, 
I'm not saying that every situation is the same, but I know that there are quite a few students that I speak to that I would say definitely have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but on top of that, if you've already you're, have your own trauma experience, having that occur, you know, it can have a, make a huge impact on both persons. And then um, secondary trauma. So secondary trauma is significant. It's, if you look at this sentence, it's a little less um, intense than compassion fatigue, but some of those symptoms are similar, but maybe on a lesser scale. So having those intrusive thoughts, avoiding certain situations, persons, topics, uh, places, um, being hypervigilant, being constantly tired, um, feeling sad, angry, struggling to concentrate, feeling detached from others, isolation, um, having to miss work or different events in your life, and then physical illness. And then this is just similar um, symptoms. Um, one thing, a couple things that are different on this list is there's one that says poor boundaries and loss of creativity, uh, diminished self-care, and then um, cynicism and insensitive, insensitivity to violence or minimization. So um, I think that those are really important symptoms to notice. And I think it's it's comp like being a teacher and a, and a champion in our school is not a simple feat. You know, it's like I said, it's more than just presenting information. You're teaching um, social and emotional learning as well by the way that you model that in front of your students. And a lot of those students will really try to make you be reactive and they notice, you know, how you respond and how you care about certain situations or talk about certain things. And so um, secondary traumatic stress can really impact not just you, but also how your students uh, learn those different traits, if they're, especially if they're not getting that learning at home. Um, and so then the other thing that can happen is burnout. And so we all know people that have felt emotionally depleted um, or mentally affected by the surroundings of their environment. Um, and so sometimes that leads to people feeling that they can't really be of service to other people because they have to really take care of themselves. And so sometimes people end up leaving their jobs and going to a different field. And um, everyone has to make the best choice for you and your family. And then um, there's a lot of studies that show that the development of secondary traumatic stress can predict how long that professional Will, it will take for them to eventually leave the field and go into another type of work. Um, and then just who's at risk? This would be anybody who works directly with traumatized children or adults and is in a position to hear the recounting of traumatic experiences um, that makes you a risk factor for having secondary traumatic stress. Some other risk factors that have been noted in research um, that are greater would be among women, among individuals who are highly empathetic um, by nature or have their own unresolved personal trauma, um, working with large amounts of traumatized children, as we do, um, being socially or organizationally isolated, feeling professionally compromised due to insufficient training, um, insufficient time to recover from a traumatic event, and then, like we said, I said previously, uh, previous trauma history. So, um, prevention and proactive. I would like for you guys to look at the professional quality of life measure assessment that I gave you. So, this is, it's three pages. And you're going to start off with uh, page one. And so, just take a minute. Go through each of these questions or these topics and you're going to rate them on a scale of one, two, five. One is never, five is very often. And so when you're finished with this, you're going to go to the third page. I don't know why they label them this way. And that's how you're going to grade your answers. So certain number of questions go with different results. So you're going to compare the answers you gave on page one 
with these different subsections on page three, and that will give you a score. Okay? Um, this is not psychological testing. This is not going to be reviewed by me. This is purely for your own survey and assessment and um, to begin to start this conversation and build awareness. So take a couple of minutes, and when you're finished, um, please put your pen down so I know that we're finished and we can kind of talk about this together. So I will not ask you to share anything too personal. Mostly I'll just be talking about this experience. So take a couple of minutes. Yeah, so go to page two, three. It's really counterintuitive. And then you look at these numbers, and that's how you okay. do it. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, so just to repeat, you'll go to the third page after you've completed page one, and you'll compare the answers you have to the um, subsections on page three. And then you go to page two. I don't know why they did it like that. It's not very intuitive. So you write the reverse score. So, um, correct. So um, on the third page, when you're looking at the burnout scale, the numbers that are asterisks, um, those indicate, this is super complicated, I'm sure you realize this, 
it's a reverse score. So if you scored a one on question number one, you would actually score it as a five. That makes sense. And there's like a teeny tiny diagram at the bottom of that that says what you wrote and what you would change the score to. Whenever you're finished, you can please put your pen down or pencil down so I can know where we are. So for the sake of time, you can continue working, but I just wanted to follow up and see um, if you guys could just share what was your experience in filling this out? Have you ever had been given a survey or an assessment like this? Was there anything on here that was surprising to you? I'm surprised as far as our responses to the question. Yes. Relate? Does anyone feel like they already knew all this information about themselves? Okay. Um, so, like I said, this is not a professional, it is a professional quality of life skill, but it's not me giving you an assessment. This is just used to kind of give yourself some information um, and to help guide you on. You know, making sure that you're on the right path for your own self-care. Um, so some other protective factors that are involved um, in preventing compassion fatigue and uh, secondary traumatic stress include having um, been in the field for a longer amount of time and also the use of evidence-based practices in um, providing care and education to students. So um, using trauma-informed care strategies in your classroom and in the school. Um, and then just a couple of other things. Self-care groups in the workplace, people do this. It's a real thing. Um, Self-care accountability buddy system. So I know that we do like lose it wars and um, walking teams and that kind of thing. Um, but this would have to do with like your whole self. So, um, and then of course, proper rest, nutrition, exercise, and stress reduction activities. And when I say these things, I'm not saying it because I think, um, I don't want it to be like patronizing because I know you all know these things, but I think it's just helpful to have a continuing conversation about them 
um, because I think, you know, in the middle of the school year, towards the end of the semester, it can get really easy to get focused on one thing and like uh, have other <laughs> things go to the wayside. So um, I know it's not as simple as it looks on paper, but I think it's good to have that conversation. So um, the next handout I want to look over is the self-care wheel. And what I like about this wheel is that it, it talks about all of the different parts of each person. So, you know, we're not just the professional self that we portray here at Seneca. We have our physical self, our psychological self, um, personal, spiritual, emotional, and your professional self. And um, some of those are, you know, private. You don't talk about those with your coworkers. But then some of them you do talk about with people that you're really close to. So um, just look through that list because there's activities on each funnel of that uh, subgroup. And it talks about different things that you can do to take care of that part of yourself. And so this isn't something you have to do right now, but look through it and you know check out the things that you feel like you do really well. Um, and then afterwards, go through it and circle the things that you feel like you want to change. And this isn't something that you have to do. You can do it while we're talking or you can do it later. Um, but just to start, another kind of open discussion is about self-care. So when I talk about self-care, what do you guys, how do you perceive that? What things come to mind for you when I talk about self-care? You say anger? Candles. 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 Okay, yeah. What? Aromatherapy? Yeah. yeah. That's good. Getting okay. enough sleep. Right, okay, so yeah. basics, like getting enough sleep, nutrition. How about Doing things you really enjoy that you're not like an expert in. Okay. I like that one. Yes, that's one of my favorites. I have a little dog. Um, so then, also, I want to know what do you guys already do for yourself um, that you consider self care, or maybe you didn't even know it was self care. You just like doing it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, who taught you to how to take care of yourself? You know, not just like how to bathe and eat, but like really look at the whole of who you are and do certain things intentionally to make sure that you can be the best person that you can be. And how was that, what <coughs> that modeled for you? Can anyone share that? That's kind of interesting because uh, mm -hmm. I'm a health teacher. Yeah. And with health component of health. Yeah. And we talked about this every day. How yeah. How to every class. Uh-huh. To decide not to do the lecture, not going to feel like doing the Spanish and English teachers. Yeah. Um, where I had, like, for example, my father, you know, dropped out of 14, yeah. kidnapped me, I used to be beat real bad. Right. So it was one of those things where I knew I wanted to cut, treat my kid or he treated me. So yeah. it was like I didn't really use him as a, it was like motivation, like I'm never going to make my people feel the way he made me feel. Yeah. I, know, I knew what his dad felt like and, yeah. you know, the verbal and things that he was like, when he's kids, they just, Jesus so bad, like, you know, like, if a teacher can cuss me out, they pull that away from me, they're not going to get it. Right. You know, otherwise, you got to really think before you're just to do it. Yeah. That's a really good point. So deciding whether you want to follow the lead of what was modeled for you, or do you want to change that and be a different model for other people in your life, the little people in your life, even. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add? Some self-care activities they do that... Know, might be interesting. I like to cuddle my pet, and I started doing a workout class um, in the spring, and I've been pretty consistent with it twice a week. Yeah. What about you guys? I color. Yeah, I love coloring. <laughs> you do the um, the adult coloring books. I do the Zen mandalas. Yes, <laughs> I love doing that. But then I find myself overthinking it, and like you know, I want it to be symmetrical with the color, and then I'm like, stop. Stop. Yeah. You're supposed to be relaxing. Well, it's like sometimes you can do it and you want it to be such a perfect, like, yes. stroke or, like, color depth that you get too intense. <laughs> I understand. I'm like, that's so crazy. Anything else? Does anyone have anything else that they, like, intentionally make time for because it makes you feel good? I like, um, like, when they do activities on their own Yeah. I can find time. Uh-huh. Do you like to learn about 
French culture and cuisine as well. Language. Just language, okay. Anyone else? I know we have some animal lovers in the corner. So like, just take their meal. So take this with you, um, share it. There is one part, like one that is a little racy that says, you know, be sexual, but you can black that out. But I think this is a good model if you ever want to have that kind of social emotional learning with kids to just give them the awareness that they are not just a student or a you know a child. They have different parts of who they are, and it takes you know a lot of effort and intentionality to take care of all those different parts. Um, so then just a couple of other things, psychoeducation. So like what I'm doing right now, talking with you guys about different statistics and not just that, but like um, doing kind of some self-evaluations on a regular basis, um, having ongoing skills training. So I think like the embedded PDs are really good because you're constantly getting new ideas um, to like regenerate yourself and your performance in the classroom. Um, like I said, a self-care accountability buddy system, that would be cool. So like instead of having like a secret Santa or something, you have like a, a self-care buddy. I don't know. You could take it and run with it. Um, and then exercise and good nutrition. Okay, so the next assessment is the self-care assessment. So that's another three-page handout that I gave you. Um, and so if you could take a few minutes and go through this. This one's a little different. It's not going to give you an answer at the end, but you're going to use a scale, so a five to one scale, and you're going to go through each criteria, and you're going to rank it for yourself. Five is frequently, and one is it never occurred to me. So um, these different categories coincide with this, uh, the wheels, and they each talk about effective strategies to maintain self-care. So then you can get a little idea for, for yourself you know, where are you being effective for yourself and where are you being less effective? And then I'd like for each one of you to pick one that you'd like to improve or change and share it at the end. And if you could put your pen down when you're finished, let me know. 